Okay. So is there any questions that anyone has from last lecture? Do you, I mean, for a quick summary, do you guys want to, do you remember what we did last lecture? We talked about input operations. And prior to that, we talked about output operations and storage operations. I think we talked about all those things in pretty great detail, right? Sure. So, so you should do both post onto GitLab and Moodle, but the way that I'll be able to track that you've actually turned in your assignments is for Moodle because that reports back to me. So, so the reason why we use two different technologies is in industry, the de facto standard that allows you to be a part of a team and share a code base across multiple people is with a version control software, which is what Git and then uh, GitLab by extension is. Git is the actual command line tool that allows you to pull or push your code onto a what's called a remote repository, which is you can kind of think of it as some server space somewhere. Like if you had uh, like uh, some kind of cloud storage, like that's effectively what GitLab is, right, for, for source code files. And so the real intent of Git is that it'll track all the changes in code so that you can have not just one person, such as yourself, implementing a source code project and then pushing it onto a repo, although that is a big use case, uh, individual projects, but it you really get to see where it's much more powerful once you have a second, a third, a dozen developers working on the same project because it gives you the one location where everyone can go to pull the project and you can have different versions of the project such as the version you're working on and then the version you're working on and then finally the main branch which would be where the the, the version that everyone has kind of made their modifications to that's like the the true source variant so the idea is that if two people are working on the same project simultaneously, it's going to be slightly different, right? Like you're going to have implemented some part of the code base and someone else would have implemented some kind of a code base. So Git helps you manage that kind of complexity. It allows you to have two different versions of the same thing simultaneously without causing conflicts. Because by, by the very fact that you're each working on a different part of the code base, that means some of your code base is the newest part, but it's also the oldest part because the other person's part they were working on is a newer part, but since they don't have your code, it's an older part. And ideally you would both get together and take your changes and take their changes and merge them together. And that's what your main branch would do. So uh, it's super important that everyone learns how to use Git. And as you, as, as you might realize, Initially, right now, there is a learning curve to get, right? So one of the worst things that we could do to prime you to go into industry where Git is like the de facto standard is to have you not have any exposure experience to Git, put you into the marketplace, and that's going to be, you're going to be expected to use Git from day zero, right? By the time, the day that you walk in, they're going to have an expectation that you know how to use Git to access their source code files. So that's what we're priming you up for now. Now, unfortunately, Git doesn't have all these really good tools to report back to me in terms of who had submitted or not. So that produces a lot of overhead on me. And so that's why I also opt to use Moodle. Moodle has a lot of uh, convenience tools for the instructor to be able to alert me when students haven't turned in a submission. So I can send an email out and say, hey, I'm missing a submission. Like, yeah, and find out. It gives me a lifeline to the students that I wouldn't be able, that would not be as easily be had. And so that's the reason why I'm going to adopt those, both those technologies. One, because it benefits you, and the other, because it benefits me. So can I add you to a file for my lab teacher? Yeah, you should do that. You should do that. Did you want to zip up our lab lessons for the last class? No, I don't care about your labs. Okay. Your lab instructors, you can send the labs. I'm only going to go ahead and look at the homeworks. Okay. So, so whoever your lab instructor is will be the one who will do all the lab grading for you. And then they'll report to me what your lab grade is, and that'll make up 30% of your grade in this class. And whatever I give you in this class is what you will get in your lab class as well. Okay. 
Let me go close this door. Okay. So I made this claim that there's five basic building blocks for every algorithm. And we've already made the claim prior to that, that all software is comprised of data types or, or uh, data models. And on top of the data models, we build our algorithms, which are just step-by-step -step instructions on how to do some kind of process. So the, the real crux of what allows our applications to do interesting things is the processing operations. This is where the magic happens. This is where we can transform our data into one form, into some new form. So up to this point, we talked about how we can store data in memory. We talked about how we can import data into our application. We talked about being able to export data from our application. So in terms of the processing operations, uh, to give you a real world example of what those might look like, I mean, they're effectively the mathematical operations and all the different mathematical operations you've learned across a, uh, your studies from from the point you entered the schooling system till today right we can make use of any one of those operators you learned on quantitative data but if you think about it you probably have been practicing using things like multiplication and addition and subtraction using strictly numbers now remember anything that you can quantify can then have adherence to any of the mathematical operators you've learned to use. But conceptually, those operations are also rooted in like real world activities. And again, I always like to go back to this idea of cooking recipes. Let's try to identify what it means to have things like addition or subtraction or division or multiplication when it comes to a recipe. So let's start with uh, addition. That seems like just being able to add ingredients together right in terms of subtraction that's like if you had a whole egg and you were told just to uh put the egg white in there let's say you're making a cocktail you don't want the yolk well you would take the whole egg and you subtract the egg yolk right so clearly there's an easy definition for addition in real world non-quantitative formats they have real concepts for what subtraction is what about division well just that idea of dicing an onion, for instance, what are you doing? You're taking a whole onion and you're dividing it into constituent pieces. That's exactly what the operation division is designed to represent. And then lastly, what about multiplication? What if you have a recipe that makes for one serving size, but you're going to have four people that you have to feed? You probably just multiply all the ingredients by four. So the, the entire point of this exercise of mapping these examples to mathematical operations is that when we design software, we're restricted to this fundamental data types that we discussed a couple of lectures ago. And, um, and when we're, we're defining how we're gonna transform our data that we have into the information we're looking for, we're going to use these mathematical operations and when we use them we want to think of them in a way of achieving what our goal is so it's like it's important to come up with a strong conceptual understanding about what these operations are intended to represent as it's applied to our data models and as it applies towards our algorithm does that much make sense and so I know that that can be that can be something that you slowly get used to. You're probably encountering that right that right now in the labs, right? You probably are challenged to use the processing operators in a number of ways to take whatever data that you start with and be able to transform it into actual information that you're looking to to gather or produce. Okay, so processing operations are the fundamental tools available to us to make our software work. We model our problems as data so that we can solve them with these processing operations. And processing operations take data values and convert them into new values of either the same type or new values into a different type. And so it's important to know that what data types you can use as 
inside of each of our data operators. So let's take a look at the first set of operations. Here, we're going to at the arithmetic operations. We're going to look at the relational operations. We're going to look at the equality operations. We're going to look at the logical operations, and we're going to look at the concatenation operations. And I'm going to wager to say you're probably all familiar with these, so I just want to highlight some facts of that. And I'm assuming you've been using these throughout the lab as well, if you haven't seen these before. But the first type are probably the ones that everyone's super familiar with, the arithmetic operations. So that would be addition, subtraction, division, multiplication, and modulus. So we'll probably cover a little bit more about modulus because that's the one you might not be familiar with inside of your uh, of your prior math classes. Uh, so the important thing here is in order to do any one of these processing operations, these are primitive operators. Primitive operators work primarily on primitive data types. Uh, and so for instance, we use the plus sign on the keyboard to indicate you want to do addition. So that's our addition operator. The dash is our subtraction operator. The slash is our division operator, and the asterisk is our multi multiplication operator. The division, the uh, percent sign is not division; it's modulus. Okay. So the big thing about arithmetic that you should always keep in mind is that it does require that the two things that you are those are, are binary operators. It means that they need two different values to produce a result, right? So if, I, if I'm gonna do addition, I need to have two things that I'm adding together. If I'm gonna do subtraction, I need two things that I'm subtracting. Like one is subtracted from the other. One is added to the other. One is divided from the other, right? Like, again, these are super basic concepts. I'm just highlighting some of the pre requirements we need for addition to actually work. But what's even more important is that the data type for anything that's arithmetic has to be numerical, which means if you want to use a new, if you want to use one of these operators, you have to transform whatever data you have into some kind of quantitative form. And then the output of anything that's arithmetic is going to be numerical as well. Okay, so I'm assuming we're good with addition, subtraction, right, multiplication, division. Well, let me ask you about division. How? What is? What is? So you're probably super familiar with division as it goes to floating point numbers, right? What's the distinction between division with floating point numbers and division with integer numbers? If I were to say, take one and divide it, the integer value of one and divide it from the integer value of two, what would the result What's that? It'd be, uh, well, like, I, in, in, a, in a mathematical world where we're not restricting ourselves to a particular set of numbers, we would then just go into a floating point number, right? We would say, oh, that division would result in a 0 0.5. But once I have 0 0.5, is that an integer? No. no, because an integer are discrete whole countable units, right? So you don't have this concept of having a number between one and two. But I can clearly do division on integers, right? Like that's still a valid operator. So then the question is, what is the result of one divided by two if I restrict myself to the integer set of numbers? It'll be, well, usually what you're gonna do to compute that is you would take and see someone had put zero yeah the, the answer would be zero so the idea here is but let's root this into what the division represents instead of thinking of it as a mechanical translation of input numbers to output numbers what does division fundamentally mean does this thing so one divided two is like how many units can we divide like how many okay yeah yeah so if i have one and i try to divide it into two parts since i have one unit i have a half part right that's what that would do now if i am allowed to have halves that would make sense but let's say you're not allowed to have halves let's say the thing you're counting are people and you don't want to have a half of a person 
right? Then you'd say, oh, well, then the result would be there are zero. I can't divide that any into any smaller groups. So the resulting process, the resulting computation would be zero. Effectively, what you're doing is you're just trunc truncating the fractional part. So if it would be 0 0.5 and you can't have the 0 0.5, you truncate that part and you just say it's zero, right? Or let, let's let's look at, but let's examine the pattern of just division. Let's say it's two divided by two. Well, two evenly divides into two, right? So you'll have one. Let's say we do four divided into two. Well, four evenly divides into two. So that could be two different parts that you can go ahead and do division by two, right? So again, think about what is being represented with a concept of division and that'll give you an idea of why we have to when when we're doing it in the confines of an integer data set why we confine ourselves to the whole discrete values we can't go outside and use any fractional point numbers so then with that said what would be three divided into two yeah it would just be one right okay so that's going to motivate whereas if i use the floating point numbers I can actually get 3.5, I can get 1.5. So again, this is going to motivate when you should use a double versus when you want to use a, an integer. So, so integer division is restricted to the integer data set. So keep in mind is that you do truncate and you will always result in something like the number zero if you divide one by two. But then, then that's going to motivate the other operator, which is going to be our modulus operator that's represented with a percent sign. So that allows us to see how many remainders are left over after division that didn't get processed through. So for instance, if I were to say here, so if I were to say, and here, these are the integer numbers. This is on this slide. This is where I kind of show the difference between integer division and a, um, a fractional numbers. So with modulus, if I say one, and then usually we say mod as a shorthand term. So if I say one mod two equals one. So think of it this way. If I say one divided into two is zero, well then how many units from the numerator didn't get processed by the denominator one right because that one unit couldn't make up a whole if we're defining a whole as being two parts and we only have one thing then we can't make the whole that we want we can't get a result so we're going to get a, a result of zero but we still have the one thing left over that didn't get used during the action of doing the division right so the remainder which is what the modulus captures, the remaining amount from that division is one unit. So one mod two is one. So what do you think two mod two is? So two divides into two once, right? So that result is once. How many units are not spent in the action of division? Zero. Yeah, absolutely. So two mod two, since it divides evenly with no nothing remaining, is going to be zero. What about three mod two? So three divides into two once, but then it still has this floating unit left over, right? Because it only is, if we think of using the number three as being three parts of one, then two of those parts go into the division of two, leaving one part left over. The modulus result of three mod two would be one. What about four mod two? Zero, because it evenly divides with you leaving nothing left over, remaining remainder of zero. Five mod two. One. So what are you starting to see a pattern when we do a number with mod two? What is the pattern we see starting to emerge? Uh, one and zero. Yeah. So if you ever want wanted to computationally, if you ever wanted to mathematically to determine if a number is even or odd, that is how you do it. That is a rule by which we can observe, we, we, we could see these mathematical patterns and then we can ascribe human meaning to that. So if you've ever been challenged to say, can you mathematically define 
whether a number is even or odd. And probably what you did was just see if, well, you probably just divided it by, see if it divided by two or not, right? Well, another way of doing that is just taking the modulus. Does it have a remainder or not when it's modded by two? Okay. So let's actually change the number though. Two, mod two is like the base case, but just to ensure everyone kind of understands this principle, what if I had one mod five? What's the result of that? Well, let, let me start with this. Let's say I had zero, zero mod five. So zero, then the percent sign, and then five. Yeah, zero. What about one mod five? So one divides into five how many times? Well, one divides into five zero times, right? And how many units were left over that got did not get expended in that division process? One, exactly, one, right? Because one divides into five zero times, but there's still that one unit that was in the numerator, right? Okay, what about two mod five? Exactly, it'll be two because two divides into five zero times, but there's still two units left over. What about three mod five? Three, four mod five, five mod five, six mod five. And you, are you gonna, are, are you seeing the pattern emerge here? So. The rule about modulus is that it's going to return back an integer value starting at zero all the way up to the number you're modding against, but not including it. So if you're mod twoing, you'll get a pattern of numbers that count up zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, because the moment it becomes the same number as the denominator, it restarts. Excellent. So everyone feels good about the concept of modulus and modulus is a super useful tool. You'll see it. You'll see it a lot inside of these labs because it's an operator. You haven't had to really been had to think about how to use in a way to translate it to like real world phenomena and our mathematical model. And so it's important to kind of get kind of fast track you onto using that operator as well. I think one of the problems that we sometimes have in math is that we don't restrict ourselves to a particular set of numbers. So we very fluidly transform between integers and floating point numbers. And having that restriction that you can't, I think it could be a very, it could be one of the um, uh, pitfalls that a new developer encounters where they go and divide a number they think they're going to get a fractional number, they get zero, and they get some erroneous behavior because they don't realize that that's the result that they're getting. But like modulus, we see all the time in the real world. Like for instance, the action of a clock on principle, anything that's circular, anything that has a repeat pattern where you have a starting point, you get to an ending point that then brings you right back to your starting point is a modulus pattern. So it's like, for instance, on a clock, after you get to 12, and you go around the clock entirely, you start over again. So I could I can represent something like a day using a modulus operator to try to compute. Okay. Or um, I think another lab example that uses modulus operators in a very kind of real world context is if we're doing something like that game, Duck, Duck, Goose, right? If you want to try to predict what child you're going to stop on. And since the children are arranged in a circle and each one is a countable unit, then I can use a modulus operator to know if I do this many rotations, what child am I going to stop at? So you, you see how we can start using these mathematical operators to come up with solutions for real world problems? So computer science is really just, it's like the word problems in all your math classes. <laughs> But it's fun because you don't have to compute it. You let the computer compute the answer. You, you just get to architect and engineer the solution. Okay. 
So with that said, uh, there are the relational. So is there any questions about the arithmetic operators? I spent a long time on them, but I think it, it usually, uh, it helps really define integer division and modulus operators. Because again, one of the big pitfalls I usually see on the first test is I'll, I'll give a, a answer, I'll give a, a question that says, what is the result of this computation? And it has the modulus operator and a lot of people do division there. And of course that's the wrong answer because that's not a division operator. So again, understand the Java symbols and what action, what, what transformation, what processing operation is going to result from that and, and what data is valid. So again, the idea about mathematical operators, it's super clear, it's just numbers to numbers, but not all of them are like that. In fact, the next one we're gonna look at will also be numbers, right? A relational operator is probably one you've seen before, right? It's the idea of less than, greater than, less than or equal to, greater than or equal to. And actually, let me see what, why do I have? Yeah, I like having access to this. This is, I like this table here, so I'll, I'll leave it on this table. So the type of data, so again, this is another operator that we'll call a binary operator. And the reason why it's a binary operator is because it requires two values in order for you to validly do it, right? So you, it's a comparison operation. So that's why we call it relational. But so what is the data type? Now, clearly I have the table on the screen so you can cheat, but in order to do anything that's relational, what type of data do you have to start with? Yeah, you have to, you have to start with numerical data. And the reason why is that Fundamentally, it's quantitative data that is apt for comparing in a relational way. So you have to be able to think of something as if it's numerically based. So even, even if you conceptually have the idea that you can tell if something is less than something else, like if I said, is apple less than banana, what might, you, what might be your result from that? Yeah, it depends on how we might define that. Like, what does that mean that an apple is less than a banana? Now, if we, if we meant, do you mean alpha numerically? Now, if you mean alpha numerically, we, we can kind of cheat because we can say, oh, we're going to start, a, we're going to treat A as if it's a zero and we can treat B as if it's a one and we can treat C. But what we're doing is we're quantifying the alphabet system. So even when these concepts, if you're like, well, I could, I could kind of make text relational. Well, the only reason why that works is because you're converting it from something that's qualitative into a quantitative format. Does that much make sense? Okay. So now this is, this is where it gets interesting to me, though. And this is where I like having this chart. And this chart, unfortunately, isn't in the book. Um, so we start with numerical data in. But what is the result of a relational operation? Unlike an arithmetic operation, we produce another number and result, right? So for instance, 1 divided into 2 is 0, right? 1 plus 2 is 3. 1 minus 2 is minus 1, right? 1 times 2 is 2. We have two numbers that we put into those operators, into that operation. We get back a new value, but it's still a numerical value. But when we do a relational operation, we start with two numbers, but what do we get back? That's right. It allows us to convert from one data model into another data model, to one form of data that is numerical, which is quantitative, I mean, qu uh, quantitative, to something that's qualitative. So it allows us to express numbers and convert numbers into things that are either true or false. Boolean data is super critical when we start designing algorithms because all of the decision operations that our algorithm can make, whether it's to repeat an action or whether it's to select one action from a group of actions that could potentially be executed, it's always based off of Boolean logic. The idea of, should I do this or should I not do this? So it's 
fundamental that we know how to take data in whatever format it's in and start expressing it in ways that can be, true to, be treated as true or false. And we'll see that when we get into the, uh, into the, um, the last uh, category, our control operations. Okay, so this is the first time where we've actually seen where we can translate from one data type to the next. So the next one, and I kind of want to separate these, is that a lot of people, and even a lot of textbooks, I think even our textbook, merges the concept of relational operators and equality operators and treats those as being the same. But I want to stress this. They're not the same. They're not in the same group. They are a different set of operations. Even though there's a concept of greater than or equal to or less than or equal to in relational, the idea behind equality is different. And why do you think equality is fundamentally different? The idea of determining if something is equal to something else is different than, than uh, deciding if something is less than or more than something else. That's right, because we can do equality on non-numerical forms of data. It doesn't have to be restricted to quantitative data. We can do equality on qualitative data and quantitative data. And that's a big thing. That's a big affordance that equality gives to us that you don't get with relational operators. And that's a big enough distinction to separate them into two different categories. So we can start with any type of data for equality operations. I could see if true is equal to true. I could see if the string cat is equal to the string cat. That makes sense. Does apple equal apple? Or does apple equal banana? Like you can, you can actually answer that without a question mark, right? And so that's the big separating point between equality and relational operations. And so again, what do we result with equality or uh, operations? There, there's two types of equality operations that you're seeing here. Uh, double equal sign represents equality. So this is one of the number one things that junior developers that early programmers make is using the single equal sign to try to evaluate equality. And that is not an equality operation. The single equal sign is the assignment operator. The single equal sign means that whatever is on the right-hand side is a value that will then get stored into a variable on the left-hand side. It's, it is the action, it tells the computer, store this value into memory. If you want equality, make sure you use the double equal sign. That will compare the left-hand side to the right-hand side and give back what kind of response, what kind of data do we get back, regardless of what we're comparing. That's right. It's a way for us to take any type of data and convert it into a Boolean value, something that's represented as either true or false. Okay, so we also have the ability not only to check for equality, but check for inequality. So is this thing not equal to this other thing? Is Apple not equal to banana? And so if I wanted to do not equal, it's going to be exclamation mark equal sign as our symbol, as our operator inside of Java. So uh, I don't know if I highlighted this before, the greater than and less than and the greater than and e greater than and equal or less than an equal, it's important that the greater than or less than symbol is before the equal symbol when you express those. So you can't flip those. If you do equal sign and then the greater than or less than sign, that's going to be an error in Java. That's not the symbol that Java uses. For that operator. So the these these are these symbols are keywords. So we don't always think of words since we speak naturally in English as being things that can be made up of symbols, but these are keywords inside of Java. So it's the same as having the keyword public or class where you can't use that outside of the way that Java expects you to use it. It's the same way for our operators. And it, so it's the same with the uh, not equal as well. Uh, 
where it's exclamation mark then the equal sign to check for inequality. And then finally, we have the logical operators. And so the logical operators allow us to take two Boolean values. So two things. So again, it's a binary operator. So far, all of these operations we've seen so far are binary, which means we need two values to result back into a new value of either a different value or a different data type. Like sometimes we'll convert between data types, like in the case of relational or equality operations. So for logical, it allows us to take two Boolean values and process it into a new Boolean value. So has anyone studied logical operators before? The idea of ands and ors and nots? So very common in like symbolic logic classes, discrete mathematics. So even if you haven't formally studied these concepts, I'm willing to believe that you kind of already can intuit what the results are going to be. So let's see if I can't model this in real world demonstrations and see if we can't like intuitively see how these will result. So if I say, for instance, the floor is white and the wall is blue, right? So the floor is white is what kind of expression? What am I going to get a result when I say that statement? The floor is white. There's a Boolean because it could be either true or false. In this instance, is it true or is it false? So it's true. The floor is white. And if I say that wall is blue, that's also a Boolean expression. It can either be true that that wall is blue or it could be false. In this instance, what is it? True. true. Okay. So for those of you who are watching, both these are true. So if I say the floor is white and the wall is blue, what's going to be the result of combining those two? It's going to be true. Now, if I said, let's play around with this concept some more. If I, I say the floor is white and that wall is blue, one of them is at least false, right? The floor is white, so that is still true, but this wall over here is white. So my Boolean expression where I assert it that wall is blue is false. And so when I try to combine the concept of something that's false, even if the other thing is true, the end result is something that's false. So let's see if we can get the logic of this and operation. So we always require two values that are either true or false. If both values are true, then the result of the and operation is true. But if at least one of them is false, either the left-hand operand or the right-hand operand, then the entire result is false. So there's four different outcomes I can have, right? I can have true and true, false and true, true and false, and false and false, right? For true and true, the result would be true. For false and true, the result would be false. For true and false, the result would be false. And for false and false, the result would be false. So the only time I ever get a true outcome with a and expression, with an and operation, is if all the things I'm comparing are true. Now, the awesome thing about the and operation is, yes, it does require two things to be compared, and only two things, but I can chain those together. I could say, that wall is true, and this floor is white, and that wall is white. And so the way that we would process that would be the same way you process an arithmetic operation that changed its operators together, like one plus two plus three. You don't do them all at once. You combine two until you get a new value. So one plus two would be three, right? And then if you were to add the three, then you take that new result and use that in the addition of that other value, three, which would produce six. You do the same thing with logical operators. You start with the left handmost side and you process until you start deriving results. And then you can chain those together with new AND operations. Okay, let's look at the OR operation. Let's see what that might appear as. So if I said, same example, if I had this, the floor is white or the wall is blue, Right. So here, the idea is that if at least 
one of our Boolean expressions results to be true, then, then the entire thing becomes true. And, and so in this instance, they are both true. So the end result is going to be something that's true. If I say the floor is white or the wall is white, that's still true, right? Even though that wall isn't white, just because the floor is white, because we have at least one thing that resolves to be true, then the entire expression resolves to be true. So what? So we have four different outcomes with an or expression. If it's true or true, what's going to be the result? True. If it's false or true, what's going to be the result? If it's true or false, what's it going to be? If it's false or false, what? So it's an inversion of the and operator, right? So for the and operator, the only time you get a true outcome is if both of your constituent values are true. Well, the only time you get a false value with an or operation is if both of your values that you're evaluating are false. If at least one is true, then the entire outcome of that operation is also going to be true. Okay. Is there any questions in terms of this idea or and and or? Even if you haven't formally studied it, that's effectively the crux of it. That's how we use it to design around that's how we use it in our algorithm designs and being able to to use them to compare our qualitative data. Okay. Am I still coming out all right? Am I as glitchy as it looks like here in lab? We have a question. What's this, what's this thing called that you said it has to find them as that is the or operator. And so the symbols that we use for the and operation and the or operation is a double ampersand. And you can see it here on the uh, on the PowerPoint. Double, double ampersand for the and. And the pipe operator is what we call that. If you're not familiar with the pipe operator, it's the same key that is like the forward slash key. So if you do like shift forward slash, it creates a symbol that is completely vertical. It doesn't have a lean to the left or right. Again, we'll call that a pipe operator, the pipe operator, I mean the pipe symbol, not operator, the pipe symbol. So we'll use two of those to represent our ors. Okay, and so there's one other operation we can do with a logical operator and it's let's see here it's probably the sec so i hadn't formally stated it there's two uh unary operators that are worth mentioning one of them is a logical operator so the exclamation mark when put in front of a boolean value flips its state so it's so so if i say something is not true what's the same thing as calling that not true is what and not false is what yeah so like linguistically that already makes sense to you mathematically we can put the exclamation mark the keyword true and that's the same as saying false it or we could put the exclamation in front of false and that's the same as using the true keyword so they have the concept of not and not just flips the Boolean state of something. But one of the interesting thing about the not operation is it's one of the rare unary operators, which means it only needs one value. Up until this time that we've covered all of these kind of primitive operators, right? Something that you should be super familiar with is, uh, is that they always require two pieces of data, right? That's why we call them binary operators. But the, the not is just a single true or single false. It doesn't use two different values. It just flips the state of the current thing. Well, what other operators in the unary operator that we hadn't formally mentioned, but it exists? Can you think of it? it and it's very much similar to the concept of the uh, not operator with Boolean data, but it's the what would be the equivalent of the not operator in numerical data? That's also a unary operator and kind of represents a similar type of pattern of being able to switch a state of a number. But what does it mean to even? That's exactly right. 
you put a, a minus sign in front of a number and it makes it a negative number. You only need the individual number, the one number, one value to make a negative number. If you put a negative sign in front of a number that's already negative, it'll flip it to become positive. So the same concept that drives the idea of not operators, we actually have that concept as numerical data as well in the format of a minus sign as a negative operator. Excellent. Okay, so we're almost done with the processing operations. And again, this is where, in my opinion, all the magic and algorithms and all of our, uh, and our software happens. Uh, so it's super important that everyone gets a firm uh, grip on these, but really easy to master. Um, the last one that we haven't seen is concatenation. So what is one of the interesting thing about concatenation? If you look at the table right here, what is the symbol we use for concatenation? It's a plus sign. So notice this is one of those rare instances where the symbol we use to do a concatenation operation is also used for another operation. What is the other operation that we use the plus sign for? Addition. So what's the distinction? When does Java know that something's supposed to be an addition operation versus a concatenation operation? Um, Absolutely. So the idea is it's going to look at the data you're providing as input. So if both pieces of data are numerical data, then it will treat that result as a numerical result. It will do the addition operation. So what Java is looking at behind the scenes isn't just the symbol of the um, operator that you're using, the plus sign, it's also going to look at what the left and right hand operand is to predict what kind of result you want. So if both operands are numerical, and that's why I like to highlight a column that shows input versus output, because this is where, again, early developers can trip up and they think they might get a numerical result, but if at least one of the operands is a string, then it's going to do a concatenation operation instead. Because with concatenation, the data type can be anything, not just numerical. And what it does is it results as a string, not as a number. And what it does is it takes, what a concatenation operation does is it takes the left-hand operand and merges it with the right-hand operand and makes a new string that is the combined two things. So say for instance, if I had the string hello, and then I had the string world, and I put a, the plus sign in between it, I'll get a result that is hello world combined. If I had the, and actually we can play around with this a little bit. Do I have a, oh, I hate when this is up here. Let me pull this down here. Let me see, do I have, I think I have my, Let's go to here. Okay, let's um, grab this and go over here. So clear here, touch. Okay, let's call this concat.java. Okay, do I need to make this bigger for you, you all to sing? Is that better? Okay, so now I have concat here. Let's go here. Okay. No, don't open, go away. IntelliJ. <laughs> okay, so um, let's comment some of this stuff out. Okay, so, oh, let's comment that out too. So let's do, say for instance, um, I'm going to have, can everyone see that? Is that big enough for everyone to see? Do I need to blow that up? Does that help? Okay. So I haven't formally mentioned this either. Maybe I should do this. If I want Java to ignore a line inside my source code file, I can put slash slash in front of it. And that creates what's called a comment. So let me formally introduce these concepts of comments since I haven't done that yet. So slash slash 
means I could put anything after that. So, if, so what I've done here is I took these lines of code that I don't want to get executed, but I don't want to delete because I want to I want to use them later. So in order to have them do nothing, or if I wanted to go ahead and add a comment, so I'm like, I could make something human readable that your future self or some other developer can come back and read that's relevant towards why, what motivated your decision for this line of code. That's another use case for comments. So comments are typically used in one of two ways. You can either provide context to what your code is doing so that others have insight on why your code works the way it does. And usually what you're doing there is you're describing your data model that you've based your logic on or how the algorithm, what, what your processing operation is doing on top of your data model to get its outcome. Or you're testing code out and there's some block of code that you don't want to run at this time, but you don't want to delete it. So we're doing the latter, but either of those are often comments. So a single line comment is slash slash two line comment. I can do slash just like that. And now I can make any number of lines, anything between this slash star to this slash star, I can have comments in and it will be ignored by the pilot. Okay. So let me just highlight that right now, which means, which means that this is not a numerical operation. Right. Okay. So let's take string. So, so one of the things that let's go back to our slide here. Here, notice that with a concatenation operation, we can start with any data, but the result will always be text data back. So let's take a look at this. Let's see the implications of this. Wait, what happened? Oh. So we text data again, we call string inside of Java. So here, let's call this variable text. So if I do, for instance, one plus two, is that valid? Yeah. Let's see, one of the best ways to see is to see if we can compile this code. And so what, what am I getting as a result when I try to do one plus two and then save that into a data type that is of data type text? What is the result here? What does the error say? So what that's letting us know is the left operand here, the one and the right operand here, the two, when we apply the plus is going to result in, why does it keep going here? Is going to result in numerical data as output, right? Not as text. And since, since, since it's an integer, we can't store it inside of a storage variable that's really designed for a string because it's using the wrong kind of encoding. Remember, one of the first things we said is the way computers store data is as binary blocks, as binary words, as just a string of binary bits. Zero, one, 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 zero, zero, one, one, one. The re reason why we attach the data type to the storage operation is so that the Java program, so the JVM, knows how to translate it back into a value that's meaningful to us. If I'm telling it, hey, this is designed to store a string, and then I try to give it an integer value, it's not going to read back the same value we tried to store there because we're taking something that's an int, and then we're going to translate it back into something that is a string. Those are incomparable, right? They're incompatible. So Java, though, one of the nice things about Java and why Java is so po uh, popular is it alerts us that we've made this mistake without us just making that mistake and getting an erroneous result when we go to run the application and finding out why is our code not working? Okay, so what about, what about this? Will this work? Well, what about this? Let's start easier. What, so that's gonna work. And actually let's, let's start doing this. What's gonna be the result of this? Actually, well, let's actually, instead of save, well, I'm going to save it in here. 
Okay, so let me clear here. Let's run it. One of the things I love about application development is we can take and always challenge our beliefs and what's happening by testing it. Okay. And there we go. It takes the value of one. It takes the value of two. Now, these aren't numerical values, right? They're text values. We're using the symbol that we perceive as being the number one, but it's the text representation of one. And we know that because we put the double quotations around it. So it's a text type, not an integer type, right? In fact, let's start, I'm now gonna start challenging, now that I've used this, I'm just gonna put right into the, uh, the print statements so that we can start seeing what the result is gonna be. So we know this is gonna result in a string, right? And so the string, now, if I remove the double quotations, now it's actual numerical types. So what's it gonna print out when I do that? Yeah, it's gonna print three because it's gonna do the numerical computation and return back an integer value, not a string value. Okay, what happens if I do this? What, it, what do you predict? First of all, there's, 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 first of all, you have to make a decision. Is this a ballot or is it invalid? In, well, let's see. So one easy way, if it's invalid, then when I go to compile, then it should throw an error for me. So let's take a look at that. Oh, it compiled. So we know it's valid because it didn't throw an error to me. So now if I run this, I know it will execute. What's going to be the result? One and two. And so, yeah. It's going to be one and two. And why can we predict that before we even run it? If we look at this chart, what is there's two, there's two possible operations that can result from the plus sign, right? Arithmetic only happens with what? If it's they're both numbers. And then what is the input data type under concatenation? Any. So if at least one is not a number but a number is still any type of data, then it's, gonna, it's going to cast. So there's this concept of casting in Java. Casting allows us to take something that's defined in one data type and convert it into another data type. Concatenation operations is a, allows us to cast our data into strings. So it will take the numerical representation of that number two and convert it into a string or text representation, and then it merges it together. Does that make sense? So, so this is an idea of uh, innate casting. There's another format that this takes. I want to I want to highlight that. So just to prove this concept, let me run this code. So here, yeah, look, it's going to be twelve. What if I did this? What if I did the reverse? What if the one came first and then the two was the second, the, the on the right-hand side. Yeah, it's going to be the same thing, right? If at least one of the operands, it doesn't matter which one, the left or the right, it's going to result in the same thing. Okay, what if I did this? Well, let's see. One, two, three, four. What if I did this? I have a question. How is the one, two, three, four if the two is in quotation? Because we're doing the concatenation operation. So think, and we, we, we follow the same rules as mathematics. So we start at the left-hand side and we work towards the right-hand side. The same as we do with reading, right? So when you read a big block of text, you probably start in the top left-hand corner and you, you go rightward until you're done reading the sentence. Well, we process our math operations the same way or our concatenation operations or any of these operations, right? So we would look at the one and then this, and that's not the numerical value of two, that's the text representation of two. So the result of that is gonna be a string of one, two. And then when I go to do the, this, that means this isn't going to be an addition operation. It's going to be a concatenation operation. So it's going to produce the text of one, two, three. 
And then here, it's going to be one, two, three, four. So once I get a string inside of my plus sign operations, it's just going to, it's going to migrate all the way through. But what if, what if I do this? What if I have, you see what I did there? And here, let me, what's that going to result in? Two, two, three, four. Let's, let's check that out. Two, two, three, four. Does everyone see why that's the case? Be the order in. That's right. Here, the first two values are going to be numerical, one plus one. Then, so that's going to result in two. Once we get two, then we're going to concatenate it with the string two. Then everything else is going to concatenation once we get that. What if I do this? What if I have the multiplicative operation between the three and the four? Well, well, let's see. Um, let me ask you this. Let me motivate. Well, there's one way to find out if that's going to be invalid. It's to, so it compiles. So what's the general rules for arithmetic order of operations you do multiplication division first then you do addition and subtraction so whether it's a concatenation operation or an addition operation the order of the plus sign is always done after the order of the asterisk sign it follows the same rules of math in in that regard so that allows us to create these really complex chain expressions that you see like for instance here here where i can mix and match uh, like that had a division in there. So with that said, what do you think the result of that's going to be? So you would do this first, you would do three times four. So then we would have 12, but then after that, everything's going to be an addition or a concatenation. So then we would start over here and do one plus one. Well, that's going to be two. Then we're going to do the text of two plus two. So that's going to be two, two. And now we're going to do 2, 2 plus the numerical representation of 12. So that'll be 2, 2, 1, 2, right? 2, 2, 1, 2. Now, if I want to prioritize things, I can always put it in between parentheses. So anything in parentheses will get evaluated first, and then you'd go back to the or normal order of operations, the implicit order of operations. So for instance, in this instance, what is the result going to be? Yeah, one, one, two, one, two. Excellent. Does anyone have any questions about this? Okay. So there's one other thing that I really want to highlight. Uh, so the operators we were looking at are primitive operators. They're primitive operators because they're these symbols that are these free-floating symbols that can work on primitive values. So what were the rules about primitive values? You remember when we talked about primitive values? We stated that primitive values always used uh, data types that use lowercase letters, right? Like int, lowercase i in the int, double, lowercase d in the double, Boolean, lowercase b in the Boolean. Almost all the data types that we've seen so far are primitive. So we can use these uh, equality signs. So all of them are prim primitive operators. They use the primitive data types to process results. But the one, the one that is not, though, is the equality one, right? So we said that could be any. So numerical, all numerical data is primitive in Java, right? So these operators, these primitive operators work on primitive data. Boolean is a primitive data type. So these are primitive operators as well. Uh, but, but equality, we said it could be any. Now, up until now, that means it could be numbers. So int, or it could be floats or doubles. 
Uh, it could be Boolean, right? Uh, it could be cars, right? But it can also be strings. And strings are different than all the other things, right? Because it's a reference data type. So let me see, let me challenge you to see, even though you haven't programmed this before, but the equality operator, since it's really designed for primitive data types, is going to behave differently for a string than it's going to for a uh, true value or a number value. So do you remember when we were looking at the string data type, what we said it was actually storing in memory? Remember when we were looking at the blocks of memory and how much each data type consumed in terms of its encoding? Yeah, like it, yeah, so it, there's a byte. And let me let me jump to that. I can, it's right here. Remember this slide here? So we said all these other types are primitive data types. However, we looked at tax and tax consumes four bytes, but in the descriptor here, where we look at the actual primitive set of values that each one of these data types is defined by, what does it say next to text? The value is the address of memory where the string is stored, right? So if we were to do a primitive equality operation on a string, what do you think it would be comparing? You think it'd be comparing the actual contents of the string? It's going to be comparing the memory address of the string towards the other memory address of the string, which is not going to produce the result you think you're, you, you want. Because then you can have two strings that have the same text, but if they're stored in two different memory addresses, it's going to think it's different. So understand, this is again, one of the, one of the big missteps that early developers in Java will do. They'll use the primitive equality operator for reference data types. And you can't do that because the default action of the primitive operator for anything that is not a primitive data type is to compare its memory addresses together to see if that reference type is in the same memory address. That's what equality means. Are these two things in the same memory address or are they in two different memory addresses? Which is probably what you're not thinking of as an equality operation on something like a string. What would you think an equality operation on a string should be? That's right. If the set of characters encoded in one string is the same as the set of characters encoded in the other string. And so the cool thing about reference data types, and we've already seen this, is that they have internal behaviors. So like when we created a scanner object, and let me see if I can't find that, when we created this, or, or like say for instance, out, when we looked at the output stream, output streams have the ability to print. That's a behavior we can tell the output stream to do. And we use the dot operator to access that behavior, that method that's built into that out, output stream. It's the same thing with the input. If we go to our input, let me go to the source code here. We created this, uh, this scanner object here, right? It was highlighted in the yellow, right? So we use the constructor, we pass in a reference of the input stream and it produces a data type of a reference, a reference type, right? Because it uses the uppercase letter for the data type. So this is a variable that we created. It's not a primitive variable because it's not lowercase. So since it uses the uppercase, that means it's an entity that resides somewhere in memory and not built into, it's not a value that's built into the JVM. But the cool things about these entities that are reference types is they support these behaviors that can be attached to them since they're, since they're in memory. And so here, this next line method that we learned to use, this next double are all behaviors that we can invoke on that reference data type on these more complex things. So strings are the same way if we want to. So what I'm trying to get to is if we want to check equality where we are comparing the set of characters to another set of characters, we have to use the dot equals method, which is built into the string. So let me comment out this. So suppose I have cat here. Does everyone see line six here? I'm going to have cat, and I'm going to see if it equals cat. 
if I want to compare, not the, great. Let me save that, clear this. If I want to actually make that comparison instead of, and yeah, get false because case matters. If I want to compare this to see if these two, if the text inside of these two strings are equal and not their memory location is equal, then I have to use the dot equals method. I can't use the uh, double equality because that's only for primitive data types. And it is valid to use for reference data types, but it's not going to produce the result you think it's going to do. It's going to show you whether the memory address is the same or not, not whether the actual entities have the same values or not. Excellent. Is there any questions regarding? Let's see, I think that might be it for. Oh, the last thing that I want to mention is just combining operations. We already saw how you can have these really complex uh, expressions. So that's another thing I want to, an expression is typically the word we use when we start embedding operators between our data types. So let's talk about mapping map. You probably hear that math is a language, right? And you're like, yeah, that's, it's not any language I've learned to speak, right? Well. So why don't we start defining math in a way that language is normally defined? So our subjects, our nouns, are our data types, like our numbers, in math. And our verbs, the things that produce actions on our subjects, are our operators. And so once you have a once you have the understanding that what you're learning is your set of nouns and verbs as they're expressed numerically in a quantitative way, then you can start mapping the phenomena uh, in the real world that you see around you into mathematical expressions as opposed to linguistic and as opposed to English expressions. So the same word we use to express a complex sequence of actions, of thought, of something that has a subject and it has a action. That's an, uh, an expression. We use the same thing for mathematical expressions. So everything we've been looking at where we've been taking input data and converting it, transforming it into different data types or different data values, we've been creating these expressions. So we use that same word. So when you hear the word expression, that's what it means. And try to map it to how you would use it in English as well, or whatever your natural language is. Great. Is there any, any other uh, questions that you might have? Well, I think that's going to be it for processing operations. The one last thing is just the order of operation. Arithmetic operations are typically done, then relational operations, then equality, and then logical. So if you had a big string of expressions, actually some operations are prioritized over others. And that's the last thing I have to say about the processing operations is really all of the verbs inside of our mathematical language. And so that's why they're so exciting and allow us to do cool and interesting things. It'd be like telling a story without having verbs, right? Verbs are what make stories interesting. Operators are what make our algorithms interesting. A mod would fall into the arithmetic operations. It would be the same as division. So actually, that's a good expression. So right there. Because effectively, it is a division-like operation. But instead of giving you the amount of uh, units that get divided, it's the amount of units that are remaining after the division. So, so you kind of kind of think of it as a remainder operator is how a lot of people end up thinking about it. Is there any other questions? Good question, by the way. Excellent. Thank you for, for uh, coming to lecture today, whether it was digitally or in person. And I will see you all tomorrow where we will finally talk about the fifth building block, which is our control operations. That's our decision points. That's where we can start just not making a sequence of statements, but actually decide, uh, make decisions while we're going across our sequence of statements. By the way, how do you, how do you I'm going to post those today. I mean, it was my intent to get those posted already, but my schedule has been insanely busy this semester already. So that's what I'm going to do right now. As soon as I get back into my office, I'm going to get all of our prior lectures and all of these slides. And 
probably what I'll also do is as I as I teach this, I'll modify the slides and continually update them with the idea that I, I want to get a nicer slide deck. Usually what I just like to do before we went into the uh, the virtual space, I, I liked having dialogues like what we're having now. So it, and I didn't like the idea of PowerPoint slides because it becomes a crib too much, but I'm starting to see the value when I have to teach online as well. Oh, great question. Let me when I try to compile, uh, it doesn't compile. Uh, let me end this.